that it subtly beats you over the head and you don't realize till you're done that it did it. So a few episodes ago, I did a review of Palm Springs and I titled that episode, Your Heaven is Someone Else's Hell, because I thought that Palm Springs would be heaven for me. Well, now you are about to experience my hell. Stuck in suburbia, in monogamy, with a baby, forever. I cannot imagine anything worse. This week we're talking about Vivarium on the Everyman Movie Review. Hey everybody and thank you for joining me for yet another episode of the Everyman Movie Review. We are back! New movies, although this one's not so new. But I'm super excited to talk about with you over the next few weeks some brand new stuff that just came out that I have been seeing. So get ready, buckle up, here we go. This was a request, not really a request, but a friend of the show said, Hey, have you seen this movie? I saw the preview for it and I didn't know what to think. And I said, you know what? I did see it, so I bumped it up. Now we're going to be doing a review on Vivarium. And this review is going to follow the normal schedule. That means we're going to talk a little bit about the people in the movie. We're going to talk a little bit about the movie, have a little bit of a spoiler section, and then at the end you'll have my recommendation on whether or not this movie should be for you. So I'm not usually a huge fan of movies that will bash you over the head with, uh, you know, a lesson or a moral or anything, but... There is occasionally a movie that is so well done that it subtly beats you over the head and you don't realize till you're done that it did it. That, my friends, is what Vivarium does. But before we get too far into it, let's get through the pleasantry, shall we? Vivarium was directed by Lorcan Finnegan. It was written by Garrett Shanley, with a story by credit going to Lorcan Finnegan and Garrett Shanley jointly. It is starring Imogene Poots as Gemma, Jesse Eisenberg as Tom, Jonathan Aris as Martin, Ayanna Hardwick as the older boy, and I know I butchered that name. I'm pretty sure it's Irish. I'm terrible at uh, Gaelic names, but apologies. It's close. And St. On Jennings as the younger boy. So I always go into these reviews thinking about, like, well, what's going to be a spoiler and what's not? We're going to have to walk a fine line on this one, so I would suggest that if you're really worried about spoilers... Maybe skip through till the very end and just figure out whether or not this is going to be the movie for you. But I'm going to try and walk a very fine line and I'll edit it up to make sure I don't give away too much. Hard to say what is a spoiler and what's not. If you've seen any of the marketing for Vivarium, you kind of understand the concept. Uh, Jesse Eisenberg and Emma Jean Poots are Tom and Gemma, and they are a couple who has been together for a while now, and they're looking to take their relationship to the next level. Now, traditionally, that would mean, you know, marriage and babies and moving to the suburbs, but eh, listen, Generation Z, Millennials, maybe even Generation Y, they are not really ones that are going to follow that same recipe. I mean, you know, again, I've said before on these reviews, I'm not likely to ever buy a house. I enjoy renting. I like living in the city and that's just going to be how I live my life. I like to just work and rent and move and be able to just pack up my whole life and fake my death, and then go on to the next town. Gotta remember to edit that part out. And Gemma and Tom are kind of in the same boat. I feel like they should be moving forward, and I get the sense that they're happy with how things are, but everyone around them's putting a lot of pressure on them. Luckily, again, people in my life, they've learned that lesson. Don't be putting that marriage and baby pressure on me. It makes it worse. I do dumb things, like the opposite. Like, hey, you want me to get married and have a baby? I'm gonna move 3,000 miles away to California backfired. But I guess they give in a little more to the pressure and so they see this uh, store that is kind of selling houses in a development. It's a real estate office and it's promotional for this development. So they go in, they speak to Martin who is a bit creepy and he's creepy in the way that I have seen the men in black portrayed as creepy. Now I'm not talking about Will Smith, Tommy Lee Jones, Men in Black or the more recent one with the Hemsworth uh, and the girl from uh, Thor. Actually, are they both? Is it the girl from Thor? Is it the guy, the guy and the girl from Thor? I don't think so. I don't think it is. Maybe it is. Anyway, not that men in black, but like the actual men in black. And the way that they're described is that like it's guys in suits and they have very pale skin and they have weird hair and weird, weirdly big eyes and they smile. And sometimes it seems like their lips are not moving and they're actually talking like you're hearing their voice in your head, even though their mouths aren't moving. And they seem a little off, like they can't really understand what emotion you're emoting at them. 
So that's a little bit how Martin is. And I mean, I skipped over it just to get into the story, but the movie opens with one bird pushing the egg of another bird out of the nest and then laying its own egg in that nest and then flying away. And we see from a distance that like that mother bird is now caring for uh, an egg that is not her own, but she thinks it is. And then as that egg hatches and grows, the bird that is clearly not their own um, is getting bigger and bigger and bigger until it's actually like bigger than the mother and bigger than the nest and, and everything. So uh, that's going to come into play later. Uh, if you stay for the spoilers, we'll talk about that. But Martin convinces him to go check out one of these houses. So they drive out there and he says, hey, number nine. Uh, so they go into number nine. And first of all, they're driving through a neighborhood, which is uh, weirdly like neighborhoods I've been in before. Every house is exactly alike. Now, Unlike reality, these houses are literally exactly alike. Down to the color, down to the yard, the shape. There is no variety. It's exactly the same. So he says number nine, and they literally are just counting to figure out where number nine is. Pull up out front, go inside. They meet him. They're talking to him, and they're looking around the house, and they're doing that, like, jokey thing. I don't know if everybody's done this before. It's weird because I do weird things, and then I think everybody's done it, but they just have, have absolutely have not. I used to go uh, to real estate offices, and I would go to open houses and stuff, and then with friends or with a girlfriend, and make up a story. Like, who are we? And then just play it out. Basically, like, make up characters and then always be yes-anding. And just see how long you can get away with it or how far we could go. Um, and we did that for fun. I was broke when I was younger, in between, you know, being rich. So I get the sense that that's what Gemma and Tom are doing. And then they walk into a room and they get a moment where they're like, you know, maybe we could. Maybe we could live this life. And they turn around and Martin is gone. Just gone. So then they are like, oh, I guess, well, I guess we're done. And then they get into the car and they go to try to leave and they realize they can't find their way out. It seems everywhere they turn leads them back to number nine and they run the car until it's out of gas trying to find their way out. So the only solution, of course, is to go into the house. And there's a welcome basket there. So they, you know, get a welcome basket uh, and that's what they eat. And uh, there's some food in the cupboards. And it's just a weird, weird, weird thing. Uh, I don't even think they go into the bedroom on the first night. They sleep on the couch downstairs. And then it's like, next day, let's try to escape. How can we get out of here? And so we see them over the course of our first few days trying to escape and being frustrated by the process. And they can't get out. So Tom decides he is going to light a signal fire. And he does this by burning the house down, burning it down. And so they stand there in the street and they're watching this entire house engulfed in flames, not burning down any of the houses around it. And also no firemen, nothing, no response. So they get in the car and they're going to sleep away the night. And when they wake up in the morning, house is rebuilt exactly like it was as if there had been no fire. There's no sign of it. Weird. Another weird thing. Oh, baby. There's a baby there. And uh, now they have to take care of this baby. And so now they start, uh, you know, a forced uh, suburban lifestyle where mommy and daddy and baby make three. And, um, you know, they're eating their cornflakes and finding things to do during the day. Uh, Tom eventually um, drops a cigarette onto the grass and it burns a big hole and he sees dirt underneath and he's like, ah, there's dirt underneath. Eventually, I got to hit something, right? Uh, they were near London, I think, somewhere in the UK, I think. Uh, anyway, so he just like gets the shovel and he starts digging this hole. And literally, he just goes in that hole day after day after day, digging a hole. Gemma is left to be the mom to this kid. And uh, weird thing, baby's aging super fast. Like, we jump from it being a baby to it being a kid and they're like, oh, 80 days have passed and we've been here 90 days and now we have a seven-year-old. And they do the thing where it's like, oh, we're gonna acknowledge it's weird, but we're not gonna acknowledge it's weird. Like they know it's weird, but they're not gonna tell the kid it's weird. Uh, so they just continue living this life day after day after day. And that's about as far as I can go without giving anything of substance too much away. I was trying to keep in mind the marketing materials. You see them, you, they're in the house, you see them. And I believe even one had a baby, so I haven't given away too much. But if you don't want to hear the spoiler section, skip down to the time down below. Uh, that will get you right past it and to the end of the review where I'm going to tell you whether or not this movie is worth your time. But do it now because the spoilers are about to start right here. Yeah, so a uh, weird kid, the the heck, man. Uh, I'm trying to keep these clean, you know, 
kid grows up super fast. And all he does is, you know, he leaves for that one. He, he starts leaving every day to go somewhere. Where is he going? Who knows? But every time Gemma tries to follow him, she can't keep up with him. And it's like, um, it's like the whole world is Penrose stairs. Uh, if you remember those from uh, Inception, like the stairs that just seem to all connect. And it's, it's like a big mess. It always leads her back to nine and she can't follow him. And then he comes back with a book and it's got weird symbols in it. And he's staring at the TV and it's all just weird symbols. And he's like, he's like, mother. And he's like so prim and proper. And so here's the thing. Uh, the kid is so much like, again, the men in black where he's like trying to mock emotion, but not know, not be feeling anything really. Just like see you. And when you're laughing, like, ha 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 ha. Oh, um, don't be sad, mom. Like, uh, like creepy, it's creepy. And I'll be honest, the kid creeped me out and good on the actor. The actor is gonna do so well because he was creeping me out during the movie. And then there's that like one moment where uh, she's like, hey, so did you see anybody else today? And he's like, oh, I saw somebody. And he's like, can you describe him for me? And it's like, and he like makes that weird noise. Oh, and then it's like, again, relative calm. Nothing happens. We're just raising this kid, this weird kid. And Jesse Eisenberg is like, 400 feet down in this hole and you're just like what is going on with this right now uh and then all of a sudden kid's a man and uh he's going off to do whatever his i'm gonna go do my thing do and john tries to follow him and can't follow him i spent the middle part of this movie being very confused and just hoping that it was gonna pay off at some point at the end and then you know you do get the like ah payoff kind of where uh she uh gets him and uh she hits him first of all tom digs up a body in a body bag and it scares him so much he gets out of the hole and then dies. And they put him in a body bag and put him in the hole. Just, I, I don't know. I, I, and I thought for a while that it was Tom in the bag, in the hole, and then we were in some kind of time loopy thing like Palm Springs. I, but in the, I'm going to get around to that. We'll, we'll get back to what this actually is, I think. Uh, anyway, so then Gemma's there, and she's like, all right, I'm going to take this shovel, and she hides in the car uh, because the kid locks him out of the house, too. Like They're going to sleep on the street. You're going to trap him in here with this demon kid, and also the kid screams. Whenever, when a kid was a little kid, whenever he wanted something, just scream, and he just, like, stand there and be all weird and creepy. Like, like Gemma and Tom are, like, getting it on, and, like, the kid's, like, staring through the door, it's so weird, creepy kid. Anyway, so Jim is in the car and uh, she's like, oh, I got my shovel. And then uh, he comes out of the house, she's like, bah, hits him. And then he's like down on all fours, like Aah! and like climbing around and uh, picks up the curb. Like it's like a sheet, dives in underneath and then she dives in after him. And then she starts seeing that like, oh, I'm stuck in, there. there's other places where this same thing is repeating. And we see the way that it ended for other people, maybe. But eventually she tumbles back out into her own world and um, wraps it all up. And uh, here's the thing. I, she spends so much time torn between like pretending to be a good mom, but not being a good mom and then kind of telling the kid what for. And Tom basically is like, screw this kid. I'm out. And he tries to get Gemma to let him kill the kid early on. And then later she's like, I should have let you kill him when we could have killed him. But Gemma's so torn between the two of them. And it's like, she's trying to put on this, like, if we're nice, maybe they'll let us go. But then like, man, screw this kid. And um, like the last thing she says to him before he zips up the body bag on her is just like, I'm not your effing mother. And like, yeah, that's right. One last full measure of devotion. What up? But then uh, the last thing we see is boy, which is why they called him boy, walking down the street doing his thing. And he walks into the little store and there's Martin dead. So he takes a name tag. Boop. I'm Martin now. And he folds Martin up in a bag, puts him in the filing cabinet, files him under dead, I guess, or Martin. Can't be because I'm Martin now. And uh, sits down and another couple comes in. And I was just like, what? 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 But then I had some time to think about it. And I said that the bird at the beginning is very important. There are species that are parasitic with another species, but not like fleas or ticks where they suck the blood. These species will deposit their young in with the young of another species and force that other species to raise it. Sometimes the young will even just destroy the nest and destroy the, like eat the parents, all kinds of stuff, not just birds. This happens in a lot of species. That we started with that before we went into the movie. Here's my take on what we were seeing there. 
And I could be completely wrong. I could be way off. But I think that Martin and Boy are part of a parasitic species. Uh, maybe they've been around forever. Maybe they've recently arrived at Earth. Who knows? The body in the hole seems to suggest they've been here for at least... This ain't the first time, I guess, you know? Um, and the going under the curb thing also suggests it ain't just one. But they somehow track Tom and Gemma in a place that time forgot, much like Palm Springs and, and that whole space, but you create these time loops and you separate this little bubble from time. Their young grow faster and mature faster and they just need someone to take care of it because they don't take care of their own young. But apparently their whole life cycle, not just their grown, their whole life cycle is shorter because Martin was like a spry 40 year old when we met him. And then one year later, when boy comes back, he's dead and he looks real old. So like their life cycle is what? Maybe like three years? They basically just trap a human couple into raising their young. Uh, so that they don't have to spend much of their lifetime, which is very short, raising young. They obviously have the ability to control time, space, space, time, sorry, space, time, uh, because they can trap them in this little bubble where time is weird uh, and space, they're not on Earth or they're not, you know, separate from the rest of us. And they're also able to create these like alternate dimensions where the same house is used by more than one person at more than one time. Because... That's what I think when he goes in the curb, he's actually going in between the dimensions. And because Gemma's not really the kind of being, maybe like those beings can do that. And again, that's how he escapes her every day by just jumping dimensions. She's not meant to. So basically like a dog that eats something it's not supposed to. The dimensions just keep regurgitating her out and into the next one and out and into the next one until she falls into the one she belongs in. And the director did that with like colors, like it's green and yellow and blue and red but you know that, that was just for the effect of knowing you were somewhere else but we see like you know the mother who's trapped there and looks so sad just like Gemma and we see the dude in the bathtub and we see the couple like getting it on and the kids just like cheering them on and that was weird 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 stuff and then she's like Bleh! coughs and back out into her reality that is overtly how I see it but I said at the beginning that it's basically a big metaphor and I got to keep this in the spoiler section because it'll ruin the movie otherwise. There have been a lot of movies that have basically shown suburban life to young people as being this trap. And they use a metaphor to do that, usually about being trapped in a suburban area. But what they almost all do, in fact, everyone that I can think of does, is back off the terribleness of suburbia. And they say, once you get used to it, you'll love this life. And it kind of turns into like one of those war films where like it's so super propaganda-y that you realize it, but at the same time you're like, I can't say anything about this because, you know, what am I, anti-America? No, of course, so it's cool. And you can't say anything. I think every filmmaker wants to make a movie like Vivarium, which by the way, Vivarium is a place where uh, anything that's alive will live. So an aquarium is a vivarium. An aquarium is a type of vivarium. A terrarium is a vivarium. It's a terrarium is a type of vivarium. Just terrarium is earth, aquarium is water. These are just things, places where people live, places where things live. And this is a place where one couple lives to raise an alien baby. In reality, not like the metaphor. But I think that the metaphor here did something that I haven't seen before, and that's stick with it. Suburbia is a trap. It sends young men off to a job that they hate, that beats up their body. And why do they do it? Because they feel some need to do something to impress their mate and to support their young, I guess, in a way. And their mate resents them for leaving every day and leaving all that responsibility of the home on them. And they love their kids, but they hate their kids. And they feel like the kids are sucking life out of them. And they're just these beasts that scream and cry and can never be made happy and even when they're happy you're just dreading the next moment that they're going to be angry or cry again it's just a metaphor for being young and going to the suburbs it's getting married and having kids and moving into a big house with a big wide lawn and a picket fence and rightly i think that that is hell and the way that they depict it is Hell, all of you out there, maybe not all, I shouldn't say all of you, that's really, that's a really 
you know, with a big brush. I can't paint it with that big of a brush. But I think a lot of people say when they are younger than me, probably like in their 20s, like, I would never do that. That sounds terrible. Who would want that life? They end up getting married and having kids and moving to the suburbs. And you try to convince yourself that this is a good life, that, oh, aren't we happy? But you're not. You kind of look at, you know, your friend from high school who decided at 34 to sell all his earthly belongings, pack a car and move it to California and be like, I wish I could be that dude. I tweeted out, man, probably like four or five years ago now that I was like standing in line at the giant with like microwave pizzas and whiskey and like just terrible, terrible food. And the guy in front of me who had his cart and he had a kid crawling on him and there was another one in the cart and he like looked at me and he looked down at the stuff in my cart and he looked back at me and I was just like, mm. like he just looked with longing at the ability to just do whatever you want to do. Who cares? Uh, the last time I had a walk of shame, which wasn't really a walk of shame, but just like going home somewhere in the morning, leaving a rave at 5 a.m. and getting in the car and having the guy be like, oh, like, aren't you too old to be going home at 5 a.m.? And being like, Psh. Son, this is how I live my life, not how I live my life. That was completely abnormal, and I do not do that. I, I need my sleep. I can't be. I'm too old for all that. But um, I could do that if I wanted to, because it's just me. I'm in control of my life. So to get back to the movie, uh, the whole point is that this movie just basically dives into that metaphor and doesn't go for the easy out. It doesn't say, oh, no, this is great. And if you get used to it, uh, you'll be fine. It says, nope, this is terrible, and these beings will kill you. They will suck your very life force out. They will use you up. And when you are all used up and you have no value, they put you in the ground, which is pretty accurate to life, I think. But I guess I should get down off my pedestal, stop preaching, um, invite everybody back in because the uh, spoilers are over and we'll get back to the end of the review right now. So for those of you who hung out for the spoilers, I am sorry. I don't know. I just got... I went all, I'm all on one. I was all on one for that, and I apologize. I meant this to be a short review, and I just went off the deep end. Anyway, here we are, and we're going to be talking about uh, whether or not I recommend this movie. This is a meta-concept movie, and I can't tell you guys why it's a meta-concept movie outside of the spoiler section, because it will ruin it for you. But once you see it, if you think you should see it, come back and watch the review. Please hear what I have to say, and tell me whether you agree with me. Down in the comments below... You can leave me a message. You can send me an email. The email's right here on the YouTube account. Or, uh, listen, we have a, for the podcast that I do every Tuesday with my buddy Corey, it's the Oh The Anthem podcast, at Oh The Anthem. Uh, it's available at OhTheAnthem.com. Uh, you can actually call and leave a message. And I would love to hear on that show from some of you about this particular movie because this is the kind of movie that Corey doesn't watch. It's too high concept. It's too complicated. He doesn't like it. So I want him to hear why he's either right or wrong about this movie. I can't give away any more than I've given without being in the spoiler section. Go check it out when you watch it. But I think that basically this is a movie that you have to be laser focused on the entire time. You have to be okay with not understanding all of it. You have to be okay with there being question marks at the end. If you watched Inception and you were said, all right, I'm in. I don't think that this is a possible thing, but I'm in with the concept and I'm gonna follow along. So long as you live within the rules of the universe you've created, I will follow you and I will enjoy this movie. And then at the end, so what? You didn't give me a clear conclusion. I'm okay with that because I enjoyed the ride. You're going to love this movie. If you like science fiction, if you like thrillers, and you're okay with that first part, you're going to love this movie. But for your average moviegoer, for most of the people that I usually watch movies with, they would hate it. And I'm glad that I took the time to watch it by myself so I didn't start it with a group and have them turn it off to turn on something else. This was great to sit in the dark and watch by myself because it's the kind of thing that I do enjoy, but it is not for everyone. It is not for a lot of people. It is for high concept, meta concept, science fiction, thriller lovers who at the end of a movie, not every movie, but maybe these movies, want to be able to say, what do I think this was? Let me put my own meaning on that. And I did that in the spoiler section. If you're looking for a relaxing Tuesday night to just unwind before bed and watch 90, 100, 110 minutes of entertainment, this ain't it. This will have you scratching your head all night long, probably all week long, trying to figure out what it is you just saw. Now, if you get past all of that and you think maybe I would want to watch this movie, listen, there are some fights. There is some lovemaking, not too graphic on either. We see Jesse Eisenberg be a little beat up, 
mainly about the work that he's doing, not so much beat physically beat up. Um, and there is a some torture, not what you would think of, not like waterboarding, but like psychological torture. And uh, that may be triggering for some people, but I would imagine if you have gotten this far and you're still saying, hey, I can watch this, you're gonna be fine. Go ahead and watch it. And please do let me know what you think down in the comments. But Bavarium still has me scratching my head. Even with everything I've got on my mind, my campaign for president, I'm running for president if you didn't know. Uh, you can follow the social media for that at Rob Cheek for Prez. Uh, my own social media at Robert N. Cheek, you can find me there. Uh, you can check out my website, robertncheek.com, where you can find links for the political stuff and all of these videos and uh, everything that I'm doing, including my brand new podcast, Rob Explains, where it's a daily podcast, usually around five minutes, where I'm just talking about stuff I find interesting or weird or cool and just discussing and maybe revealing, explaining for you some things that you've always wondered about, myths and legends and interesting things. And of course, I'm keeping up with the Everyman Movie Review social media. You can find links for that down in the show notes below. Uh, I got a lot going on and this thing really canoodled my noodle, I'll tell you what. But if you're down for that kind of thing, you're gonna love this. If you're not, skip it. And if you have any doubt, skip it, just skip it. Trust me, trust me on that one, all right? But what you shouldn't skip is the next review. We're keeping up our pace of two episodes per week, every Thursday and one day in between. So much new content for you week after week. I made it my goal to get at least something out every single day. I'm doing that with the podcast by itself, but we're also putting out new songs. Well, we got new short stuff coming out. We got short films and, and editorials and the podcast and my podcast and these and everything else. So much stuff. So don't miss out on any of it. But until next time, please take care of yourselves and each other. Have a great week, everybody.